just a little bit. We'll be in Revelation chapter 11. But let's start out with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into our study for tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you tonight, and we just say thank you for allowing us to come back to your house, study your word. Father, for the things that you do for us, Lord, the things that you have uh, um, plan on doing for us, we just thank you tonight. Lord, help us understand your word tonight. Help us to see the things that you want us to learn, Lord. Just open our hearts and our souls to you. In your name we pray. Amen. So we'll be in Revelation chapter 11. It's where we'll be at tonight. And as we get into this, uh, we're going to be looking at the two witnesses tonight. But before we get into the two witnesses, uh, there's a little bit of an interlude, or a little bit of a, a first section here in verses 1 and 2 that, that talk about some other things other than the witnesses. But just to catch you back up, we've had six seal judgments. We've had six trumpet judgments. And we are between the 6th and 7th trumpet is where we're at right now. So we're still in this kind of interlude between the 6th trumpet judgment and the 7th trumpet judgment. There have been, we were warned before the 5th trumpet judgment that there would be three woes. We've gone through one woe. We're in the, we're in the midst of the second woe with the 6th trumpet. And the third, trump, the third woe is going to be the 7th trumpet. And we'll get into that later. We will probably spend two weeks on the two witnesses. We'll probably spend two weeks on these uh, on this lesson tonight, and then after the two witnesses, we'll get into uh, the, the get into the follow what follows up with the trumpets there. So, uh, Revelation chapter seven tonight, beginning in verse one. Before we get to the two witnesses, it says this: Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And so what we see here is we see John given this, uh, this job, this, this task, to measure the temple. Now, uh, not for sure exactly all the reasoning for this in Revelation, so I can't really get into all that tonight. Uh, some people believe that he was measuring um, the temple that was already there. So they believe that maybe he was uh, measuring uh, the, the temple of Herod. But by the time John wrote Revelation, that temple had been destroyed. Some people believe he's measuring a new temple, the temple that will be built sometime before the tribulation period happens, according to the Bible, this temple will be built. They believe maybe he's measuring that temple that is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Some people believe that he is, this is symbolic, that he's really not measuring anything. It's just symb it's a symbolism of what God's getting ready to do. But I believe that he is measuring the new temple that will be built. And it says that he's going to be measuring this new, he's measuring this temple and that he is to measure the inner, inner temple, which is made up of the holy place and the holy of holies. And then he is to uh, measure the altar, which I believe is the brazen altar located in the inner sanctuary of the courtyard. And that is where the people would gather to worship. And that's where he would, would, would uh, measure he was commanded to leave out the court which is outside the temple. And that is in reference to the Gentiles, not Israel. Remember, the whole tribulation period is about bringing Israel back to God in God's judgment. And so when he's measuring the inside of the temple and he's measuring what's happening in the in inner parts of the temple, what is happening here is he's, he's just doing this for the Israelites. This is God's kind of symbolism of saying this is just for the Israelites. Everything in the inner part of the temple, the inside of the temple, was for the uh, Israelites. The, the distinction here is that God is sending John to measure the Israelite people, but not measure, not have anything to do with the Gentiles. And if you go back to, to verse 2, he says that they will, the Gentiles or other people other than the Israelites, will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And so we see this emblem here of God saying, John, measure the inside, measure the people. This, this part is still Israel's, but then don't worry about the outside because these nations for 42 months, three and a half years, exactly half of the tribulation period, they will dominate the city of Jerusalem during this time. 
And so I tried to find uh, an image of Herod's temple so you could kind of get a better idea uh, of what we have here. So this is Herod's temple. The new temple that will be built in Jerusalem before the tribulation period starts will be similar to this. You'll see the holy place up here. The holy place is where only the priests are allowed to go in. This is where God would, would meet the priest. You see the altar there, and then you see the women's courtyard, and then you see the Gentiles' courtyard outside of that. So John was told to measure everything, uh, basically, that is encased in the walls there and leave the outer courtyards alone, is what he was told to do. Because in the days of, of John, in the days of, the, of Jesus in the temple, the Gentiles could not enter into the temple area. There where it says the gate beautiful, a Gentile, non-Israelite person, was not allowed to enter into that gate. If they did, the, they had permission from the Romans to take that person and stone them to death. So the Romans gave them permission to do that. And so only the Jewish people could come inside of that gate. If you study the book of Acts, you'll see in the book one time uh, where uh, Paul was uh, accused of bringing a Gentile into the part of the temple there. And so they wanted to stone Paul because they, they accused him of bringing a Gentile into that area of the temple. And so as John is measuring this temple in, in Revelation, what we're seeing here is we're seeing God basically saying, I'm going to put a distinction between the Israelites and I'm going to put a distinction between the Gentiles during this time is what he's doing. And to do that, he is getting ready to introduce us to two of the most uh, well-known people in, uh, the, in the tribulation time, in the book of Revelation. Uh, a lot of people know about these guys. We've heard, of, we've heard of the speculation about them. And that is the two witnesses. And the reason that he tells him to measure, I believe, that he tells him to measure the courtyard on the inside and to measure the altar and the people that are worshiping there, and then he introduces the two witnesses. It's because I believe these two witnesses, as we're going to see, I believe they are sent by God for the Israelite people and the Israelite people only. Their job, while they are here on earth, they're going to be witnessing, but their main witness is going to be to the Jewish people. And I believe that's kind of what God was setting up as he was telling us about this, uh, about this uh, uh, measuring that John was going to do. So tonight we're going to start the two witnesses. This is what I, we're really going to spend all our time on tonight. And we're going to break this down into two parts. I normally don't do part number two when we're doing this study, but we're going to do this. Tonight is part one. Tonight all we're going to do is look at what the Bible has to say, what the Bible clearly tells us about these two men, and we're not going to speculate on anything tonight. This is just going to be biblical fact that I can show you what the Bible says and nothing else. Now next week, we're going to look at part two of this and we're going to look at who we think they are based on what the Bible says. And then we're going to look at when they are going to be on the earth witnessing because those are two kind of controversial topics that you'll see when it comes to the two witnesses. So I want us to look at those and have you kind of make up your own opinion or have you at least have the knowledge of what the Bible might say about those. But I'll go ahead and tell you now the same thing I'll tell you next week as we start next week's study. No matter what we look at as their identity and no matter what we look at as when they are, when they're here on earth, it's pretty much going to be speculation on, on our parts uh, on that. But what we're going to look at tonight, these are just going to be facts from the Bible that we can see. We're not going to get into these other views or anything. This is going to be very simple, looking at what the book of Revelation tells us about them and then going step by step about what we do know and what their duties are going to be. So the first thing I want us to look at tonight is going to be in verses 3 and 4, and it's going to be their calling, their calling, what they're here to do, really. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 3 says, and I will give power to my two witnesses. They will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. 
And so these two verses give us a little bit of information about their calling. The first thing that we see is that their power is given to them by God. So they will come to earth, they will be here, he will have two witnesses, we don't know who they are, but there will be two witnesses, and they will be given power by God. He says, I will, this is, the, this is God speaking to John, I will give power to my two witnesses. He is going to empower them to do the things they are doing. Here's why that's so significant. Here's why that's so important. Everything that's happening on the earth during the tribulation period, whether it's at the beginning, the middle, or, or at the last everything that's happening is the Antichrist going against God but in the middle of all that, we have to remember that God is still the one in power. God is still the one that allows the demons to do things. He's the one that allows the Antichrist to do things. And here we see him saying, I'm going to give my power, I'm going to give power to these two witnesses so they can go do the things that they need to do. The other thing that this tells us is that Satan cannot control what God does. Satan cannot control what God does. Satan may have control of the earth, the church may be raptured, but God is still the one in control. And so he sends these two witnesses and he gives them his power. Well, what, is, what does he give them the power to do? Well, he gives them the power to prophesy. Now, when you hear the word prophesy, what do you normally think? What do we normally think about? We normally think about what? Future. Future events. So when we look at this and he says, I will give them power to the two witnesses and they will prophesy, we're expecting them to be telling people about the two events. But in all reality, when you see the word prophecy or prophesy in the New Testament, it always goes back to proclaiming or preaching. Not prophesying about the future. That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, its meaning is to proclaim or to preach. And so these two witnesses will proclaim to the world, preach to the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will be primarily, they will be here to do two things to witness to the Israelite people about Jesus Christ, to tell them about Jesus Christ. And they will be here to proclaim to the world that all these disasters that are happening to them, everything that's coming upon the earth, are coming because of God's judgment. And so I believe when it says they will prophesy that they will be preaching, proclaiming the word of God, they will be witnesses of God. They will be ones that will come in and they will be witnesses of what God has done, what Jesus Christ has done, and that all of these things, all these... Uh, horrible natural disasters, the deaths, all of these things are God, God declaring his judgment upon the earth. We kind of know that because of what it says about them in verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Well, the two lampstands represent, and the two olive trees represent people telling others or telling the world about God and Jesus Christ and that comes from the book of Zechariah you can see that we're going to get into that next week so I'm going to talk about this a whole lot more next week because as we try to figure out who these two witnesses are we're going to be looking at the book of Zechariah and we're going to see what the two lampstands and the two olive trees stand for but basically it stands for men these two witnesses proclaiming the word of God to a world around them and so these two men will have their power from God. That's the, that's the most important thing to know. They will preach the name of Jesus Christ. They will prophesy about God. And they will do it for, it says, 1,260 days or three and a half years. That is exactly half of the, half of the tribulation period. And so... Some people believe it will be at the beginning. Some people believe it will be at the end. And that's what we're going to get into next week when we look at the, the timing of it. But what you need to know is they're going to be around for a while. This is not going to be a couple of day them standing out there. They're going to be proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ for half of the tribulation. What does that mean? 
That means that the whole, that half the time that Satan is in charge, that half the time the world is persecuting Christians, that half the time all these disasters are happening, these two witnesses will be in Jerusalem proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and proclaiming to the world that they need to come to him for salvation or they will die. So three and a half years this is going on. So just picture this in your mind. For three and a half years, they are proclaiming right the opposite of what Satan, the Antichrist, is proclaiming. And he can't do anything about it for three and a half years. Okay? And so we're going to see why he can't do anything about it in just a second. But he can't do anything about it for three and a half years. So for three and a half years, here they are proclaiming God's name and Satan, the Antichrist, is powerless to do anything because of their protection. The next thing the Bible tells us is it says that they are clothed in sackcloth. Why is this important? Why is their dress important? Well, sackcloth, if you study the Bible, uh, you, you see this mentioned a lot of times. It's a rough, heavy, kind of coarse cloth that would be worn. But anytime it was worn, it was always worn for mourning, for distress, for grief, or for humility is when it was always worn. And so we see these two witnesses come to earth with the power of God wearing sackcloth. I believe they're wearing the sackcloth to show the sorrow for the world and what's happening in the world. I believe they show it humility because they are there by God's will and doing God's will for them. I believe that they are here for grief and distress over this world that is being overrun. Think about what we've studied to this point. The world has been overrun with, with death, with famine, with fires, with natural disasters, with stones falling from heaven, with demons coming up out of the pit, with people not being able to for months upon months, and then death to a fourth or a third of the world. I mean, think about what the world's been on, been through. And these men are here, and they're clothed in sackcloth as grief over all that's going on. They're mourning over what's going on. They're probably also mourning over what is happening at the temple with the Antichrist and what's going on there. So they come not as proud men, not as proud witnesses, but they're coming based on this, their sackcloth, they're coming as men that are humbly preaching with the power of God in their voice. Which brings us to the next point. Why can't the Antichrist touch them? Why can't the Antichrist do anything to them? Look at what verses 5 and 6 says. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So first thing it says, fire from their mouth. So if they, someone comes to harm them, the Bible says fire comes from their mouth, destroys them, and if anyone wishes to harm them, look at what it says, he must be killed in this manner. He must be killed in this manner. So some people don't believe that this is literal, I see no reason to think that this is not going to be literal. I, we can't picture someone spewing fire out of their mouth. But I can't see anything in the Bible that would show me that this is not a literal teaching that fire will come forth and this is the way that they will destroy the enemy. God has used fire throughout the Bible to destroy his enemy and there's no doubt that he will still use it during this time. There's no reason that I can see in the Bible anywhere that this is symbolic. I believe it's going to be literal fire. And so God has done this before. If you look in Leviticus chapter 10 verse 2, it says, So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And then you look in Numbers 11, 1. Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. And then in Psalm 106, verse 17 and 18, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the faction of Abram. And a fire was kindled in their company and the flame burned up the wicked. So God has a history of using fire to devour evil. 
What's he going to do at the end of time whenever judgment comes? He opens up a lake of fire. And all of those that have rebelled and all those who have gone against God will be sent there for eternity. So, first of all, Antichrist can't do anything to them because if anybody gets close to them, anybody tries to harm them, number one, they've got God's protection. They are basically immortal until God says they can die. And they, they're protected by this fire that comes. So the question then becomes, well, why would the Antichrist want to kill them? Why would people want to kill them? And then he gives us the answer in verse 6. Verse 6 tells us that they have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So here's the scenario. These two men are preaching and teaching the Word of God. They're teaching about Jesus Christ. They're teaching about the judgments that are coming up on the world. Antichrist is in the world trying to get people to worship him. He's got his false prophet running around the world telling everybody to worship him as God. And you got these two witnesses over here that are telling everybody that he is a false God, that he is Satan, that he is probably the, the devil. And... What do you believe? And then all of a sudden, these two men have the ability to shut heaven up so that no rain can fall in the days of their prophecy. So anytime they want, anywhere they want, they can shut the rain off. They can they control who and who does not get the needed rain for the crops and the things that are going on. And remember, when all of this is happening, we still have God's judgments coming upon the earth. And so these men are being here and they can shut down heaven. They can turn water to blood at their request. I believe that this will most often be used uh, probably for uh, drinking water, but they can turn the water to blood. And then they can bring plagues, plagues to the earth, strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Think Egypt. <laughs> Think Egypt. God didn't tell us what they could do, which plagues it were, were but it says all plagues. They can do as they desire while they're there. And so here they are on the face of the earth proclaiming Jesus Christ and they have the ability to do all these things to the world anytime they want. Do you understand now why man wants to kill them? Number one, man's going to want to kill them because of their message. Number two, man's going to want to kill them because of what they're doing. Number three, man's going to want to kill them because the Antichrist is going to be telling everybody to kill them but he won't be able to do anything to them because every time someone gets near them to harm them, they will be consumed by fire and they will die. And so this will go on for three and a half years. This will happen. Until finally God does what God does and he allows, he allows Satan to touch them. Look at verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. So for three and a half years, he's going to do everything he can to kill them. And he will not succeed at all. But then after three and a half years, the Bible says that when their testimony is finished, when they have finished proclaiming all that God wants him, them to proclaim, that the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, Satan... When he comes up, God will allow him to make war against them. The beast, the Santa Christ, the, the man of sin, he will come up and he will make war against them. And when he does that, he will kill them. And so these two witnesses, these two people, will finally be killed by the Antichrist or by Satan because God allows it. Now, I believe that these men, as we will see more next week as we look at their identity, they know what's going to happen to them, but they also know that for three and a half years, nothing's going to happen to them. And then Satan comes and Satan kills them. And so finally, they're, they're dead. The enemy has defeated them. But we want to see kind of what the world is like at this point. So look at verses 8 through 10, and we're going to get a good idea of what the world is like. Look what it says. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. 
And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and sing gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So we see what the world is like in that day. First of all, they don't allow them, they don't allow them to uh, be buried, just lay there in the streets or lay there on the street of the great city. Now, John made sure we knew what the city was. Notice he says that it's Sodom and it is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, but it's where our Lord was crucified. So when he says it's where our Lord was crucified, what does that tell us? It tells us this is Jerusalem. So the city is Jerusalem. We don't have to worry about that. The city is Jerusalem. We know what it is. But what's sad about this is that this is God's holy city. And John is telling us that spiritually it has become Sodom in Egypt. Spiritually it has turned its back on God. And it is now like the world. And so this may be Jerusalem. This may be God's city. But now it's controlled by Satan. And so these two Men, these two witnesses, they will lie in the street for days. They will lie here, not being buried. And in those days, this was a sign of, uh, of disregard. This was a sign of humiliation, of dishonoring, of desecrating the bodies when this happened. So it's bad enough that they sit there for, for days, not buried. But then it says that the people will see for three and a half days... They will see their bodies. And then it goes on to say that they will rejoice, make merry, and sing gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. The world is so spiritually gone that they will have parties and celebrate the death of these two men. And for three and a half days, they will watch and it will be a spectacle. Now, you know how our world is today with TV and internet and all of this. So this is going to happen in the future. So we can only imagine how much publicity something like this might have. It will be everywhere. No matter what kind of media they have in those days, everybody in the world can literally see what's happening there. Uh, I hate to even kind of use this analogy, but it's the best thing I can think of where everybody in the world is watching something. This wasn't a tragedy, but think about when um, the, the prince got married in, in, I can't even think of their names now, in England. Um, y'all help me here. I know y'all know their names. Huh? That was one of them. William, William and Kate. That was the big one, though. Yeah, William and Kate. That was the big one. What did we see even here in America for a week? Where did the whole world see for a week? Everywhere you went. You couldn't go on the internet. You couldn't go on TV. This is going to be even worse than that, I believe. Because it says they're going to party. They're going to celebrate. They're going to give gifts to each other. They're going to send each other gifts. All because these two men of God have been finally killed after three and a half years. Okay? So it's not going to be something where a lot of us turn on the TV, saw what was happening over in England, and turned the TV back off because we just didn't care about it. People are going to be happy that God's men, God's witnesses are dead. But it will only last for three and a half days. Then we see what happens in verse 11 and 12. Look at this. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. So, a couple of things that happen here. First of all, the world is partying. The world is sending gifts to each other. They're merry. They're having a good time. They're watching on TV, the internet, their phones, whatever. They're seeing these dead bodies. And then all of a sudden, it says the breath of life from God, he's the only one that can do this, he comes down upon them and they stand up on their feet. Three and a half days later, they're alive again. And the whole world is watching. So what is the whole world seeing? The whole world is seeing God breathe life into them. You hear people today say, well, if we had proof that, that Jesus really did rise from the dead, if we just really had proof that Jesus did this or that, well, after three and a half days, the whole world is going to see two men rise up from the dead by God. And then it says the fear fell on them, but then they're going to hear God say, come up here, and they're going to see these two men ascend to heaven in a cloud. 
And they're going to see them ascend to heaven. And it says their enemy saw them. And so this is different. I want to go ahead and put this little footnote in here. This is different than the rapture. This is not the rapture right here. Some people look at these verses and they say, well, this is when the church is going to be raptured. But I, I don't agree with that. And here's why. It says, they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. When the church is raptured, the Bible tells us it happens in the twinkling of an eye. It happens in the instant. One minute, somebody will be walking in the field with someone. The next instant, that person will be gone. They won't know what happened to them. But the Bible says here that these two witnesses, they're going to come alive. God's going to breathe life into them. And then he's going to call them up to heaven. And they're going to ascend and rise into the clouds, into heaven. And everybody's going to watch it happen. What's the world going to think about that when it happens? When God calls his two witnesses home. When he calls them back up to him. When he calls them to him. What's going to happen? Their hatred and everything that's come about... They could do nothing. They were powerless in the end to fight God because after three and a half days, God gave them life and he called them to heaven and everybody watched it happen. So what kind of reaction would you get from that? Look at what happens. And then in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So verse 13 tells us a few things. It says that after they ascended, that God sends another kind of smaller judgment just upon Jerusalem, just upon Jerusalem. And it says that a tenth of the city fell and that 7,000 people were killed. So we see 7,000 people killed. We see this earthquake destroying a part of the city. But Something happened this time that has not happened in any of, other, any of the other judgments. Look at the last part. And the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Okay. So here's the picture I want to end on tonight. I want to end on this tonight. For three and a half years, God's two witnesses prophesied, told the people of Jerusalem about Jesus Christ. They denied, they denied, they denied. Some of them may have, may have called and come and phoned and know Jesus Christ as Savior, but they denied for three and a half years. Satan was finally able to destroy the two witnesses. The world celebrated. Three and a half days later, they were risen, called to heaven in front of everybody. After that happened, this earthquake came. 7,000 people were killed. But then instead of the people cursing God like they always have in all these other judgments we've seen, it says they gave glory to the God of heaven. And so if you look throughout the Bible, you can see several instances where it talks about people coming and giving glory to the God of heaven. When they do that, when they say that, that is a saying that people are coming to Jesus Christ for salvation. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing a large portion of Jerusalem coming to Jesus Christ for salvation after the witnesses are killed, risen, and this earthquake happens. For the unbelieving world outside, they're seeing all this, but for the people in Jerusalem, what they're seeing is they're seeing and understanding and knowing God can save us. There is salvation in God. And so people are coming to know Jesus Christ after the witnesses are ascended to heaven and the earthquake hits. So once again, as we've seen since we've been doing this study, God is still giving people a chance to find salvation amongst all of these things. And so with everything happening, God is still sending people down. For three and a half years, these two men proclaimed Jesus Christ. For three and a half years, people are having an opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior amongst everything else that is happening. God is doing that. And God is saying, I still want to see you come. Now these two witnesses, because they were in Jerusalem, I believe most of their, their focus was on the people of Jerusalem, the Israelites, the Jewish people that had rejected Jesus as Savior. And then, to end it all, 
The Bible tells us the second woe is past. So this ends, this kind of ends the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet was the second woe. So this ends the sixth trumpet. And the seventh trumpet, the third woe, is coming quickly. And we'll see what happens there. So to wrap up tonight, hopefully all we got were facts tonight. Biblical facts. I know this might have been not what you were expecting. Next week, maybe more what you're expecting about us figuring out, okay, can we determine who these two witnesses are? Can we determine when they were in? And, and some other things, questions like that. But what I, want is, what I wanted to do tonight was just show you the facts of the Bible. And the facts of the Bible are very simple. There'll be two witnesses. They'll be in Jerusalem for three and a half years. They'll be telling the world about Jesus Christ. Man cannot harm them. If man comes to harm them, they will spew fire from their mouth, and that's the way they must be destroyed. They will have the power to shut heaven and earth, or shut the, the rains come into earth. They will be able to turn the water to blood, and they will be able to put plagues upon the earth at any time they desire for three and a half years. After three and a half years, the Antichrist, Satan, will be able to wage war against them only when God allows it. They will, they will be killed they will be left in the street for three and a half days while the world celebrates, while the world sends gifts to each other, while the gift world parties. After three and a half days, God's Spirit, God will breathe life into them once again. They will rise up for all to see. They will ascend to heaven in front of everybody. After they do that, a great earthquake will come, destroy a tenth of the city, kill 7,000 people, but a multitude of people will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior because of that. Those are the facts, okay? I, I, that's what the Bible tells us. Now, everything else is speculation, but the Bible tells us those as facts. And the greatest fact, in my opinion, out of everything you see here, isn't the fact that they can shut all the heavens up and, and the plagues and the fire, is the fact that after all of that is done, God still gives people a chance to come to Jesus Christ, and they do. That's what's going to be amazing to see. Because at this point in the tribulation, people don't want to have anything to do with God because of everything that's happened. So, that's all the facts about the two witnesses. Now, next week, come with your questions that I won't be able to answer because that's when we're going to get into these. We're going to look at, who do you think they are? We've heard everything. We're going to look at several different people that we think they are and why we think they are. We're going to look at, when are they on earth? Do they start... When the rapture happens, do they come on earth when the Antichrist comes? Are they, on, are they at earth in the middle of the tribulation? When are they witnessing? When does this three and a half years happen? And, and so those are the two big things we're going to look at next week. But come with other questions about this because uh, next week is going to be a little different where we speculate a little more. But tonight, hopefully, you got just the facts on what we want to do here. So let's close in prayer tonight. We'll go over our prayer list real quick. And then uh, we'll be dismissed. But let's uh, close in prayer for the Bible study. Father, we just thank you tonight for this study. Lord, I, as we think about what we've read and what we've seen, Lord, help us to always just look at what the Bible says. And, and Lord, go by what your word says. And Father, I thank you tonight for your hope that you give amidst all the other troubles that happened, all the things these, these witnesses will be able to do, all the things these two will be able to accomplish. Father, in the end, you will still use them to bring people to Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for that even now. Lord, we don't even know when this will happen. But we do know that people will come to know Jesus, and we thank you for that. We pray now that you use us to help others here and now to know Jesus and to know about what's happening in the end. And, and Lord, use us to go and tell them about you, Lord. Be with us. In your name we pray. Amen.